this one. I tried, I was going to put it into this slideshow, um, a, a list of US interventions in foreign countries over the last 100 years. But there were 18 pages on the list, and I couldn't squish it onto the slideshow. And it starts in 18, 1890. I'm going to read you some, I mean, just because, you, you know, even for a skeptical old, uh, uh, old unreconstructed leftist like myself, I, I find it kind of breathtaking. So if you start in 1890, the U.S. attacked, uh, and let's take 1890 through 1911, just for, for, for a start. The U.S. attacked um, Argentina, Chile, Haiti, Hawaii, Nicaragua, China, Korea, Panama, Nicaragua, China again, Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, Nicaragua again, Samoa, Nicaragua again, Panama, Honduras, the Korean Dominican Republic, Korea, Cuba again, Nicaragua again, Honduras again, Panama again, uh, Nicaragua again, Honduras again, uh, China again, and uh, Cuba again. Now we're talking now, uh, that's, that's 20 years. And um, if we bring it up a little more recently, up to date, um, uh, well, let's take the last 30 years just for fun, I suppose. Uh, we've got Vietnam. There's Guatemala, by the way, 1966-67. Uh, Cambodia, Oman, Laos, um, Chile, Cambodia again, Angola. Uh, U the U.S. Uh, gave military assistance to South African uh, rebels. Um, uh, Libya, El Salvador. Libya, by the way, you'll remember, um, shot down uh, uh, naval jets. Uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua, that's we're talking about the Contra operation there. Uh, Lebanon, military intervention in Lebanon. Grenada. Um, uh, you remember the Grenada invasion, by the way? That was a humanitarian intervention. And remember, who's telling us this? I mean, when you read the stories of what's going on, the globe, the star, this, that, and the other, uh, ask yourself how much skepticism. Remember, they went there to rescue, as I remember, uh, medical students from the US who were being threatened by the Marxist government of Grenada. The whole bullshit. Um, there, there was a, a military, uh, a military uh, what's it called, uh, uh, airstrip being built by the Cubans, uh, um, by the Cuban army. The Cuban army was there in force. Um, well, Cuban construction workers were there. Um, there wasn't much evidence of the army being there, but no matter, we've forgotten that. Um, uh, 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 let's see, what have we got here? Hun uh, uh, oh, um, Bolivia, uh, um, Libya again, 1989, uh, Panama. Um, we don't know how many people died in the assault on Panama where they went to get Nick, uh, Noriega and changed, uh, changed the regime there. Um, and we don't know that, and we all know that uh, now that uh, Noriega is in jail, the drug trade is finished. Uh, and also now that we've invaded Afghanistan, the drug trade there is finished. Um, we, you know the opposite, by the way. The much more good quality heroin and hashish on the streets of Toronto than there used to be. And we can thank, uh, we can thank, uh, you know, support our troops. I suppose is a, is a phrase uh, for being cynical. Uh, Liberia, uh, Iraq, Kuwait, Somalia. Well, Kuwait, let's try that. I mean, uh, uh, and look, this is all an exercise in just memory. We need memory. We really need it really badly. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Nobody had much of an appetite for attacking uh, Iraq until we got this poor woman wearing a shador who came on television and told us that when the Iraqi troops, those brutal bastards, invaded Kuwait City, they took over a hospital and threw Premature babies out of incubators. They're pretty horrible, eh? and it kind of works you up, right? Except it was a lie. Except the woman was uh, put up there by Hill and Knowlton, an advertising agency, uh, to do all that because uh, the American people needed to be uh, worked up. And, and look, you know, I'm, I'm not discrediting the American people. I mean, I'm glad that they need to be worked up for this. I'm glad people have humanitarian impulses. And it's not simply a question of saying we need to grab the oil in the Middle East. Oh, we need to stop the Chinese from getting the oil in, in Darfur, right? Obviously, that doesn't wash. And you've got to say to your own population, no, we're going in there for good reasons. We're the good guys. We're the uh, 7th Cavalry. We're, we're the guys in the White House. We're going to help. Um, uh, Gulf of Tonkin. Everyone remembers that the Lyndon Johnson ordered the bombing of North Vietnam because of the um, uh, attack by North Vietnamese forces on a US uh, ship in the Gulf of Tonkin. Never happened. Never happened. And the Americans say, remember the Maine. That was the, uh, the cause of the Spanish-American War, uh, where the battleship Maine was uh, attacked by the Spanish. That didn't happen either, by the way. So we really should remember the Maine, and we really should remember the Gulf of Tonkin, and the invasion of Grenada, and the invasion of Panama, and so on. Uh, the difficulty is that 
As soon as the dust was settled, Nehru said, well, we were, we were driven into war in Iraq by a series of lies, weapons of mass destruction and, uh, and this, that, and the other thing. I mean, I, I remember the night Colin Powell gave his famous speech to the UN with showing you know, satellite photographs of trucks and all this kind of crap. I, I was on a show which is now gone called Counterspin, and I was debating against the head of the Canadian Jewish Congress who has an interest for some obscure reason in attacking Iraq and so on. And uh, I made a bit of a joke. I, mean, I said, I said, well, you know that there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq because uh, the, the proof of that was that the Americans were preparing to attack it. You know, it's not like a joke because they only attack weaker people. That's the that was the joke of it. You know, so I got attacked in the Canadian Jewish News later that week as being a marble-headed leftist, and they gave the joke but without the punchline. I said, there was proof there was no weapons of mass destruction, but then they don't give the punch, didn't give the punchline. And the guy who wrote the article has never apologized to me, although I know. Anyway, so well, what I'm trying to say is, here we have this massive list of U.S. interventions. I mean, I mean, you can't count them almost. And as I say, 18 pages of them that I pulled off the internet. <laughs> we turn around to them and say, "Please, Mr. Bush, Mr. Obama, American Marines, you've got to help out. We trust you. You're the armed forces there to do to do the world good, you know. And, and who's saying this? It's Human Rights Watch saying this." It's Amnesty International saying this. Amnesty, by the way, bought the baby's incubator story, so applied the sinker and repeated them. Now, I'm not saying Amnesty doesn't do good things they do, but but um, uh, I read a good book by an Italian anarchist, actually, who says that the NGOs and the humanitarian organizations are the world's new missionaries. The missionaries, as you remember, used to go to Latin America and. Uh, convert the natives and so on, and then, and then they would come back when I was a kid. I always remember stories in the British papers of nuns being raped in the Congo. Well, you know, the day after nuns are raped in the Congo, the, the, the British Marines are in there, right? Because, you know, we're going to protect the nuns in the Congo. Who may or may not have been raped, I don't know, but uh, um, um, there we are. So let me move on. Uh, Warren Harding, this is when you Senator Warren Harding, Harding before he came. He said, we unsheathed the sword in the name of humanity and we gave proof to the world at that time of an unselfish nation. And, and that's what's critical about all this. You know, not, only, not only do we ask for the Americans to send the troops in, but we say it's a sign of your unselfishness. You're no longer protectionist. You're no longer, uh, I don't know if protectionist is right, but uh, 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 American exceptionalist. You're not, you're not sticking within your own frontiers. It's, it's your duty to the world. So the responsibility to protect is a humanitarian impulse. Just like it's, we're so unselfish to bring democracy to Iraq, to bring stability and peace to Afghanistan. I mean, who, who could gainsay those motives? They're just superbly wonderful motives. And, and sorry if we bomb a, a bomb a wedding party full of uh, civilians, they shouldn't have been in Afghanistan at the time. It's their fault, you know. I mean, they should know it's uh, dangerous. And here's our next uh, prime minister. Um, the 21st century imperium, because only him, he would use a word like imperium, you know. I mean, the, the, anyway, it's a new invention in the annals of political science. Isn't that fabulous? It's just fabulous, you know. Um, an empire like a global hegemony is grace notes of uh, free markets, human rights and democracy, enforced by the most awesome power the world has ever seen. Uh, Guantanamo, Bagram, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, a new invention. I mean, did, did, does Michael Ignatiev actually think that when the Romans tramped all the way to my native Wales on the one end of the world, they actually went a bit further, uh, and the Middle East on the other. They were saying to everyone, let's do this because we're really nasty bastards, or we're bringing the benefits of Roman civilization with us. I mean, one of the benefits of Roman civilization, by the way, was that anybody could become a Roman. Didn't matter the color of your skin or your religion. You could also become enslaved. You could also become a Roman. I mean, at the time that the Romans were attacking the Jewish uh, uprising in uh, in uh, Palestine, one of the generals was Jewish, Josephus. And he was a full Roman citizen. But, uh, so uh, I'm not sure that the uh, 20th, 21st century imperium is quite as liberal as the Roman Empire. But anyway, not on that point anyway. And here's a couple of other um, 
in great humanitarians. National uh, sovereignty is an obligation as well as an entitlement, and government will not perform the role of government forfeits the rights of a government. So here we are, we're back to failed states and, uh, and deserving and undeserving nations. Uh, there used to be deserving poor and undeserving poor in, in, um, in Charles Dickens' time. And so there we go. Uh, let, let's guess the government stated from and Richard Poe think forfeited those rights. Would it be the Americans by breaking international law and attacking Iraq and Yugoslavia and Panama and Grenada and Vietnam and uh, et cetera, et cetera? Why is it attacking Vietnam? The Americans dropped, I mean, you probably know this, I'm boring you with it, but the Americans dropped more bombs on Laos, Laos during the Vietnam War than all sides dropped on each other in World War II. And who's been prosecuted for that? I, I know they're trying to prosecute some aging leaders of the Khmer Rouge. But how did the Khmer Rouge get into power? And by the way, <laughs> the Khmer Rouge, of course, they have an interesting history. When Vietnam um, attacked you know, the Americans protected the Khmer Rouge, but, but you know, we don't talk about that because our, our memories are very short, you know. Um, this is the United States Chair of Human Rights, who says the following, which is in line with what I think, I guess. A logical conclusion might be that humanitarian crises are sometimes engineered to bring Africans to their knees, so that from the source of the crises, humanitarians can then intervene to address up the suffering inflicted. And let me tell you what I think uh, Professor Omara of two means. And I, I, I we get to the most controversial thing, I guess, which is Darfur. So in Darfur, you have a war going on, fighting. And you have rebel groupings, and there are a large number of rebel groupings, and the Sudanese government. And Darfur is part of Sudan. And there are some people who want to break Darfur away from Sudan. So the rebels, by the way, don't exist in a vacuum, actually. They actually don't exist in a vacuum. They're supported by Chad, a nearby country, which is which some of them are supported by Chad, and some of them are supported with arms, money, and, um, and uh, advice by the United States and Israel. So, when the uh, crisis happens, and there's this nasty fighting going on there, and the, the, the uh, fighting is fueled, in part, by foreign intervention, which is happening, right? Which is the foreigners supporting the the the, uh, the rebel troops. Human Rights Watch and George Clooney and uh, I, I hate to, you know, I'm just disappointed with George Clooney because I enjoy him so much as an actor, you know, but he, he, he just stands up and makes a fool of himself over the floor. But they you know, say, well, we've got to intervene to stop the mess. I want to say to, to Mr. Clooney two things. One thing, we're involved in the mess, actually. Actually, we have been intervening. That's number one. Number two, when the rebel forces understand that their irons are going to be uh, uh, pulled out of the fire by the 6th Cavalry, I said 7th Cavalry, but it's the 6th Cavalry, by the 6th Cavalry, what's their interest in peace at that point in time? And you can tell the proof of the pudding is there. They're not coming to the, to the table. And our great humanitarians, the Human Rights Watch, Stephen Lewis, etc., etc., we talk about such things. I'm not sure Stephen Lewis said anything about Darfur, but he's talking about Zimbabwe. They don't sit down and talk about international peace conferences, diplomatic pressure. Let's get people together. They talk about sending the goddamn troops. And I tell you something, the JEM movement thinks when they send in the troops, they'll get to power. So what the hell do they need to put their arms down for? No one's telling them to put down their arms. Certainly not Human Rights Watch. They're not telling them to put down their arms. So. The U.S. then supports a group which is creating chaos there, and I, uh, I don't know enough about it to see who's worse, the JAM or the Sudanese government, or who's doing which or what. And I, I don't know enough about it. I'm not on the ground. I do know that the Chinese have oil uh, uh, concessions in, in Darfur. I do know that that's probably upsetting to the United States, but I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, but it seems to me obvious that the call for humanitarian intervention, for responsibility to protect, for us to go in there and stop the genocide, by the way, by the way, the European Union said it wasn't genocide, the Americans are saying it is genocide going there. But the call to go in there and stop the genocide is creating more suffering. Because the parties are not going to stop warring 
Well, the prospect of foreign troops uh, looms on the horizon. Uh, and I want to take the other thing, the poster boy for humanitarian intervention, and this is uh, something which I know something about. I've appeared as defense counsel for a long time for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. The story is about uh, the American government because of uh, uh, racism, indifference, and exhaustion after Somalia didn't intervene in Rwanda to stop the killings in, in, in 1994. The problem with that is the facts. And the facts are the following. That at a time when the US was twisting arms around the world for intervention, and foreign intervention and troops in Yugoslavia and so on, they were similarly twisting arms at the UN Security Council for no intervention in Rwanda. And it wasn't a question at that time about American troops intervening in Rwanda. Madeleine Albright says that she worked tirelessly <coughs> to prevent any country from intervening in Rwanda. The US didn't have to expend one soldier in 1994. And here's another fact which is stubborn and people don't talk about. The government, which was overthrown in 1994, the Rwanda government, which is now accused of being the architect of the genocide, asked after the, uh, after the presidential plane was shot down April 6, 1994, went to the UN and said, please send in foreign troops to stop the killings. At the same time, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, now the government of Rwanda, heavily supported by the United States, still heavily supported by the United States, said to foreigners in Rwanda, and this is by about April 10, we will not guarantee your safety. We will shoot on any blue helmets who come in. Now what do we take from all that? Those are facts, they're incontroverted, they're not, not nobody, nobody disputes, I think, those are facts. But what do you take from those facts? Was it racism that caused the uh, Americans not to intervene? Let me argue you one other fact. The Rwanda Patriotic Front and the Ugandan government invaded Rwanda in 1990. At that time, the Rwandan army, the army which was accused of committing the genocide, was 5,000 strong. Only 5,000 strong. Because the Rwandan government had a treaty with France and a treaty with Belgium. And Belgium and France said, you don't need to have a big army. If you're ever attacked, we'll come and help you. We'll send our soldiers. You don't need a big army. Have a small army. So they had a small army, 5,000 people. And when they were attacked by Uganda and the Rwanda Patriotic Front in, uh, in 1990, who vastly outnumbered the 5,000 people, by the way, France and Belgium sat on their hands. And they sat on their hands all the way through to, to uh, late in 1994. France sent in something of a force in July of 1994 called Operation Turquoise. It did have some effect in, uh, in, in stopping some of the killings that, uh, um, that were going on there. The Rwandan army, by the way, now is 50,000 strong. 50, 10 times the size of the army, uh, uh, army before. And now, that Rwandan army is on, it invaded uh, a Congo twice, overthrowing its government once, and is now uh, heavily backing Laurent Nkunda, who is the uh, uh, so-called rebel there, although Laurent Nkunda, to my understanding, was a member of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, now leading his own army. I don't believe that the Rwandan government has um, ever charged him with desertion or anything like that. So the Rwanda story, I think, at the end of the day, is that the US had a horse in that race. And the horse was the Rwanda Patriotic Front. That horse has come through in spades for the United States since. It's created chaos in the neighborhood and transformed that area of Africa from an area with strong ties to Europe to an area with strong ties to the United States. The U.S. had a horse in that race. It was not going to intervene and didn't want anyone else to intervene militarily because it wanted its horse to win the race. And its horse, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, was really clear that they didn't want any foreign intervention. The hapless party that wanted the foreign intervention, that wanted assistance, was the existing government, which is now overthrown and gone. So you can understand Professor Amara Atunu, who's saying that foreigners have been interfering in our affairs lighting fires, and then they say, look at that fire. We better come and put it out. And the only thing is that when we come and put it out, we change things. We change governments. I mean, does anyone think that, you know, humanitarian intervention, for example, in Zimbabwe is going to leave Mugabe in power? It's ludicrous to think that. That wouldn't be the goal of it. Uh, anyone think that, uh, you know, humanitarian intervention in, uh, in Afghanistan would do other than put 
put in power uh, a man who used to work for the CIA in Standard Oil, Mr. Karzai, whose, uh, whose government writ, I think, uh, doesn't extend to the suburbs of Kabul. Oops. Oops. Hey. So here's something we should probably should listen to, and that's the uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, President of the People's Republic of China, who says we're against any willful inter in intervention on the ground with a rash conclusion that the nation is unable or unwilling to protect its own citizens. Um, I, I, and that, oh, that's the end. That's good. So that's, I mean, that's the problem. Uh, so, that, so that's the problem we have. The problem with the responsibility to protect, uh, let, let me just back up a little bit. I was talking about the laws of war. Up until the end of the Cold War, I, I think um, all the legal scholars understood that there were only two ways that a nation could legitimately use armed force uh, outside its own borders. One was in self-defense. And self-defense is always extraordinarily narrowly uh, uh, construed. You really have to have troops just about to stream over your borders and airplanes in the sky before you can attack back. And the US used the defense of self-defense in the world court in an action brought by Nicaragua. And Nicaragua is complaining about the Contra War and the uh, mining of its harbors and so on. And the world court said, well, uh, 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 and the argument of the US is, well, you know, we're going to have creeping communism that's going to come up and kill us all, and, uh, and uh, also that the Nicaragua is sponsoring terrorism and something like that. The world court said, that's not self-defense. So, in fact, the world court at that point in time said, you're talking about humanitarian intervention, um, because you say you're doing it for humanitarian goals, and that's unacceptable. And they awarded billions of dollars against the United States, which the United States has never paid. The, the World Court since 1949 said that humanitarian intervention isn't a proper cause of war. 